Have you tried using hand planes only to become frustrated that these dang things won't work? And then just reach for your sander? Well, I want to share with you tonight three tips. If followed, you will enjoy all the great advantages you get with a hand plane. Can save you a ton of time with this. Stick around. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, I've got hand planes in my cabinet. If you're fairly new to this, those are my favorites. Early on, I struggled with hand planes. I could not get them where I felt like it was an advantage to even pick it up. But uh, over the years, I've learned a few little tips that'll get you over the hump and have this become an effective tool in your tool bag. So. The first thing is sharp. You gotta have a good edge. And I'm just gonna go through a really crash course in sharpening. This is not as exhaustive. We've actually linked to several videos I've done where I've gone more in depth. This is a standard plane. The frog, the support is at 45 degrees. So the bevel edge is down. This is the chip breaker. I'm just gonna take this off so I can get at the plane iron. This is the plain iron. This is the all important cutting edge right here. This is a beveled edge. Now, when you sharpen a plain iron, you could freehand it and hold it up on the bevel, but because this is a fairly thin blade, it's difficult to hold that bevel without rolling it a lot. If we had a thicker iron, it's quite possible to feel you're on the bevel and lock in and get a nicely sharpened surface. But here with planes, it's really useful to use a honing guide. It'll hold you in position. So we just set it in there, it holds the blade square, and depending on how far forward or back you put it, you will be changing the angle of the, the uh, grind on the stone. So typically, for numbers sake, I grind the angles on the, uh, my eight inch grinder to 25 degrees. And then I usually will set this at about a 30 degree angle and then hone on these stones to get a really fine edge. Now to do that, I actually have this little block here already set up. This distance from this front edge to this block will create the exact distance I need to get that 30 degree edge. So I'm gonna just hold this up tight against the wood and then the jig right up against the board and I'll snug it up. And you can figure that out by initially using a little gauge that will show you you're on 30 and then you, with this attached, you'll set it on a board like that and then tack a little stop there and you'll have your own. So every time you go back there, it's at the angle you want. Now I'm going to snug this up and I'm going to go through the paces. Now the reason I'm, I got this on my mind the last few days is I've got a lot of uh, soft maple to sand and I'm about to assemble the bases of this workbench project we're doing and you can see it's kind of hefty chunky material and I didn't pre-sand it or anything. So all, before gluing it up, if I could just s quickly skim over these inside surfaces, it would be very easy for me after they're glued up to do any final sanding I need to. Because these surfaces still have joiner, planer marks on them. And prior to gluing up, it's so much easier to just give it a quick skim and then clamp it up. All right, so we've got our angle. Let's get to our stones. I usually, if I, I'll, after the grinder, I'll go from a thousand, then to a mid grit, uh, like I do a 4,000, and then you could stop at a six or eight, that's plenty. But I happen to have a 10,000 grit Ohishi stone that I got from Lee Nielsen, and it's such a beautiful stone. Why not use it? So I love going to that 10,000 for the finish. Gives you a really beautiful polish. But once I've held this edge, 
all I have to do is wet this a little. And these stones are super dense. Um, there. I've already got it there. Now, one thing I'm doing here is because this is a narrow wheel, I'm actually pushing into this corner and then this corner. Ideally, I end up with a very soft radius or camber on the lead edge there. That helps to create these almost very subtle scallop shavings so you don't get that hard dig line on each end rather than it being dead straight across. All right, so, All right, so then I'm gonna just uh, hit this until I see the even matte sheen of the 1,000 grit stone. Then I'm gonna go to the 4,000. Let me just, uh, I like just wiping this off before I hit the next one. And again, I'm pushing in on the corner. And then I'll flip to the back and I'm just gonna, you have to polish the back just the same. Once you get it polished up, um, you don't have to touch the back as much, but the, the sharp edge is the combination of those two surfaces meeting in an edge. So you've got to actually have the same hone polish on both surfaces. So you're sharpen the back, almost like it's a knife edge. You've got to hit both sides. So once I've got it, that looks pretty good. I'm just going to scoot through this because this blade was not in bad shape to begin with. And now the final 10,000 grit. Uh, Tom, um, Tom's asking, would a block plane iron be sharpened with that slight radius? No. Uh, certain planes in my cabinet there, I would never put a radius on, like the miter plane. This one here it works with a shooting board. So you, you want it dead flat for shooting miters and angles and like that. Um, same with a, a block plane. The joiner plane, that's the number seven. That's for edges, long edges, and you just want those dead flat too. So those are gonna stay flat. The only ones I put cambers on are those that are gonna do surfaces like uh, the smoothing plane, my number five, and sometimes this low angle number five as well. All right, so I'm just gonna hit the back on this 10,000 grit. I'm just holding it good and flat and slightly lifting it up to make sure I get that grind and polish right out to the edge. And it is just gleaming. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. Can you? Yeah, you can. Good. And now I gotta just final home this side, go into it, to it. Are you sharpening on the pull and push strokes? Uh, not so much the pull. I'm usually in the push and I just sort of lighten up on the, I'm not pushing down a ton, but I'm, I'm putting force down into the corner to try to just achieve that slight little camber. Can you see that edge now? Yes. See how yeah. that's the leading Shiny. edge. So I polished this a few times. About half of it is polished. The back is still the 25 degree grind. So once I get it down a ways, then I, I may take it back to the grind and then you're just hitting the front edge. That's great. All right, so let's take it out. I like to hit it with this uh, rouge. This is a green jeweler's rouge and you could put it on, on leather, very traditional, but I've got it. You can also put it on wood if it's good and smooth. And this is a piece of basswood and I just charged it with jeweler's rouge and I just hold it flat on there. I've got little brads under there, but this is not where I usually use it. I just give it about 10 strokes on the back. It's, you can see when it's beautifully polished. All right, there we go. Now I'm gonna just get this back together, come on the back, slide it up. Not sure Eric what says, I like 400, 600, 800, 1000 grit wet dry sandpaper adhered to float glass when finished with a leather, then finished with a leather strop. My chisels and plane blades are super sharp. Comment yeah. on this method versus the stones. Um, I honestly, I'm not a, I'm not a stone snob. I am a, I am what's works for you. 
um, fan. So if you have, if you like sandpaper method, or if you like uh, oil stones, or diamond paste, it doesn't matter. It's just whatever you use, and if you get a system that works well for you. I like the system. I just find water stones are no, known for the speed uh, of cutting action and for the beautiful edge it produces. Here's the next tip, all right? We'll, I'll keep taking questions, but we got a good edge. We feel comfortable about that. So we want to be sharp. We want to be slick. Oh no, he's going to do three words that begin with S. <laughs> now you can use um, a lot of different types. I have, I've seen a lot of people just grab a stick of paraffin. I just, I just prefer the, the paste and get it on there. Um, now I'm going to set the blade back in. Bevel side goes down. Remember, the, the, I go more into depth on the other videos. So we have sharp and slick, and the last one, slight. How about that? Slight for the depth of cut, okay? Do not try to take off an eighth of an inch. I'm backing this off now, and I'm getting it nice and even and thin. So we're gonna take off a nice shaving. We're not gonna fight this. Now, right here I've got pine. This is a great, wood to start with because you, it's so forgiving and it's so fun to plane. But if you want to see what you're doing, you can scribble on the whole surface with the light bouncing. I can see the joiner marks here. They're ripply all the way down. Now, if I can get rid of those really quick, I don't even have to sand before I assemble. I'll do some final sanding once I'm assembled. All right, so I'm, I've got this set. Now I'm going to be looking for where that shaving is coming out. I want it to be even. Okay, I see it's coming out a little to the right there, so I'm gonna just adjust slightly to the right. And I've got a slight shaving, I'll stay here. Okay, that looks like it's coming out of the middle. Now that's very wispy. I'm gonna dial it out a little more, that's a little light. I don't wanna have to push hard, right? We've, we've got the wax, we're sharp, and look at that, here we go. What kind of wax did you put on there, Tom? I just put some butcher's wax, but now look at the shaving. See how thin that is? But notice it's, it's thicker in the middle and then it goes out to nothing. Can you see that in the camera? Yeah. Sure. It's just really thin and wispy. That's from the very subtle camber. Okay, now it's really subtle. It's not like it's scalloped like that, but it's not, it's flat enough. All right, so then I, I can still see a little pencil mark here. Is that your Stanley number five, Tom, or four? This is a four. I don't use this as much as the five. So I've got a low spot right there. See that? I There's see a, it. I still see the pencil mark there. So this is great because if you have snipes, like especially on a, maybe a little tabletop that would show up and be a, a bummer when you're in the finishing stage. If you have a snipe near the end of the board, it, shows when you're hand planing and you get that out uh, a lot of times a sander can't doesn't get that out you you don't see it because it's toward the end and you get stuck with a snipe i'm going to go here's the number five okay this is usually my usual plane let's put this guy back up and i treated it the same way i think it's set up let me dial it out a little okay so see nice same same thing. Now I'm, I am not working hard at all. All I'm doing is holding the nose down, moderate pressure and pushing it through. And look at that, it's just perfect. So that's just like glass. And if I stay even with the strokes, I'll maintain the square and I won't have to worry about it. If it, sometimes, it makes me feel good just to take a piece of very fine paper, um, you know, 320, and just give it a quick hit. But one of the other beautiful things about a hand plane surface is if it gets wet, the grain does not raise. You never get that fuzz. So if you're gluing up and you know you're going to have these inside corners, if you can have a surface that 
was hand plane and then maybe very lightly sanded, you won't have any grain to mess with. So let me take up one of these, these now, these are the soft maple and this is the bench base. So I'm gonna look at the grain. It appears to be rising a little bit this way. So I'm gonna start behind the grain here. Working on, I'm working on my bench on my bench. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna just back this off a little bit. Do you have any corrugated sole planes? Do I have a corrugated plane? <laughs> <laughs> this is the number eight of the same Stanleys. Wow. But this was restored by you, Dave. You remember that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautiful plane. That's that's does a great job. I did some reading on it and it doesn't really, you would think, oh, it lightens up the surface tension, but um, in physics, just you have the same amount of weight over, so it doesn't really lighten that up. I'm not sure, I think, I think the main advantage of it is flattening the sole. So that's one other thing that I'll go into in the other videos. If you have to restore kind of a, an older plane or one that's not great quality, you need to flatten that sole. So uh, I use sandpaper on, on glass, like plate glass or granite. And you just take the blade out, obviously, and you hone and flatten the sole. Um, as long as you're really flat right in front of the blade, you know, for the most part. So a sole like that, that's corrugated, is easier to keep flat. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna get some pencil marks here. This is the real thing. I've got to glue this up and I want to clean this off. So let's just go nice and easy. That's nice. I can see, I can see the, uh, the ripply, ripple marks from the, the planer, but I'm just kind of subtly over, overlapping here. I can actually feel the ripples of the planer. I have a question from Ross. He says, what is the best oh. way to plane quarter sawn oak? Can't get wispy shavings doing the way you are demonstrating. <laughs> um, some woods are really problematic and challenging. So when you have highly figured wood, I used to think that, oh, you got to come in at it at a very low angle, but it's actually the opposite. So the relative angle of your, your iron is best at 50 to 55 degrees. Um, they make special soles for that. And when you sharpen that much higher, those, that angle of, of entry into the cut actually will skim over highly figured wood like that with less problem. I actually ground this plane with that steep of an angle um, on the blade, really kind of steep angle. So, it gave me those results. So this is just so polished feeling. It's beautiful. And then I would flip it. You know, I can hit all the sides here. Looking at the grain again. It's hard to tell. Tom, does, does the finish stick to a hand plane surface well or should you scuff it up with sandpaper before planing, after planing before you finish? Oh, um. I usually do final sand at a very fine grit. Um, the hand plane quite often is to make sure I get all the bigger issues gone and know they're gone. Now I'm not opposed to using a sander. I love the sander actually. And we linked you to one other video on flattening large tabletops. And I talk about the merits of this uh, belt sanders in my history but I also try to integrate where hand planes will really help you out because in the right situations, they can offer you a lot of control and speed and save you time sanding. So I'm a big fan of having all the tricks in your bag <laughs> and you can go to whatever works. Lupe is asking, so there's so many planes out there, four, five, six, out. eight, 62. How do you pick a plane for a job? And how many places, planes does a human need? <laughs> as many as possible. Actually, you know what? You're gonna find that you only use, uh, you know, 
probably you're going to have a favorite one. This is mine right here. I love this number five Stanley. It's an older plane, but it performs beautifully. I really like this number five Lee Nielsen too, but it's harder to adjust because it's this low angle. It's not the same model, but I have tried the one that Lee Nielsen makes in the same and it's great. It's just heavier. And this one is just so nice. It's hard. You know, you'll find one that you really like and so you don't need a lot of planes. I'd rather have one or two that I, I felt really good with and, and could tune it up and work quickly like this than have a whole army of them. And with regard to joining or flattening large surfaces, what, what is the difference between using a seven or an eight? Um, those, those are made for more for large or long edges than large surfaces. If you're doing a large surface, you don't want the plane too long because it wants to chew everything like a skating rink. I mean, like perfect flat. And a big table doesn't have to be perfectly flat. You'd rather have a plane that would go into little areas. Um, but those are for shooting long edges. So, you know, if you're doing the long edge of a door or something that just needs that edge. Or if you're gonna do a glue up, like I have often used that joiner to joint edges prior to gluing up. And I do worry sometimes, like the early question about the finish adhering, um, I often think, is the glue gonna hold that perfectly polished hand plane joint? And uh, I've talked to the people at Type Bomb, they say, oh yeah, it will, but I don't know. I just, I still give it a very light scuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to hit this side and listen. Any more so, questions? Yeah. What's the best way to deal? Brandon's asking, what's the best way to deal with tear out if you're only getting it in one small area? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that, that actually is the situation in most cases. All right. I just went over that whole thing. Fortunately, I didn't get any. Oh, but I got a little snipe here. I can feel it. It's still not there. See? So I would have to look at that the rest of my life on my bench. So I'm glad we saw it here. I'm just going to make sure Me I get that. Me too. <laughs> now, um, as far as getting a small place, uh, that's where the card scraper comes in. So if I have a little place of tear out, sometimes it's just a, a really wavy spot. I will just detail that. I'm not going to see how you get these very wispy shavings. These can go in either direction doesn't tear out the grain. So I would detail that little spot. And then you do have to sand uh, anyway because the card scraper doesn't slice like a plane. It has a bit of a crushing action, but it does create the shaving with the burr, but it's kind of like curling up that shaving using the burr. <clears throat> so, um, but if you're interested in card scrapers, we do have a video on tuning in one of these up too. But so that's a nice tool to just get rid of those little tear outs. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I've got a little more work to do on this, but it doesn't take long to just skim the surfaces. This one's already slick and glassy. And so I'll just hit this mid rail is going to get hit all four sides and that'll get set in between here. And once I've got it glued up, it would be really difficult to sand right into that edge. So this is where it comes in so handy just to hit it like that. Hey, remember if you like this content, please consider subscribing, liking and sharing, and especially head on over to our website, epicwoodworking.com. Thank you so much for hanging out with us here yes. in the shop. On behalf of the camera lady and myself, Look forward to seeing you next time, right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. See you next week. <laughs>